Uh, this has been, this program, this part of the program is built two ways. Once, it, one time it was presented to me as uh, Joy and Cheryl's experiences in, with the Duke Ellington Band, and the other time it was just with my people. Um, are you, shall we do, do it from the beginning, Joy? Do it uh, however you want. Okay. I'm, I'm up for it. Um, I know that uh, you've been the subject of an oral history interview at the Smithsonian, and you've been on a panel there. Um, talking about your background with the band. And um, I think there are probably a lot of people here who don't know some of the things that I learned there. Um, so uh, you, would you tell us about, um, in the beginning, it was your father that arranged for you to meet Duke Ellington, is that right? Yes, it was, uh, actually, we'll start from the beginning. I uh, wrote lyrics to take the A train. Uh, and the way this came about is as a child, I always loved singing. I, I loved it. I, I used to listen to Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday and all the singers, and I would, you know, learn all the words to all the songs, and I would sit up in the window of my house at, at two, or, two or three in the morning listening to the music and singing. And my parents were in bed. Nobody knew this, of course. One time, I remember the mother said, are you still up? Why don't you go to bed, you know? But anyway, I was listening to a Glenn Miller rendition of Take the A Train. And it was, you know how Glenn played anyway, it was so beautiful. I'd never heard the song before. And uh, I said, I gotta sing this. I wanted to sing as I did with all the other songs, but there were no words. So I was a writer, I was editing my school paper, and I wrote a lot of poetry, and so I wrote lyrics so that I could sing it. And I was singing the song, because it was popular at the time, that it came on quite a bit. So as most kids do, I went to my father and I said, just casually, you know, I, I wrote this, and I, I want to hear the song, and I sang it to him. He said, that's very good. He said, you know, Duke Ellington wrote that, and I didn't know that before. He said, you know, he might be interested in hearing these lyrics. Well, my father was a man in public life. He knew everybody in Detroit. I lived in Detroit at the time. And uh, he made arrangements for, the meet, for me to meet Duke when he came to the theater. And uh, so Duke was at the downtown theater in Detroit, and at school, that's all the kids were talking about, I was going to meet Duke, and I got a black dress, and I had a, bought some veiling. I wanted to really look sophisticated, you know? And uh, I was 15 years old at the time. Anyway, and I went down went backstage, I saw the show, went backstage, and I can remember this imposing figure coming across the stage with this little fellow beside him, who was Billy Strayhorn. And so Duke said, uh, you know, so, so charming, he said, uh, I understand you've written uh, words to take the A train. He said, uh, we'd really like to hear that because we weren't able to come up with anything. He said, this is Billy Strayhorn, he, he wrote the music to it. So Billy sat at the piano and he asked me to sing it, and of course I sang it. And uh, then he said, uh, sing something else. Well, I wasn't prepared for that. I, I had no idea, but I knew every song in the books at the time. And so I sang another song. When I finished, he said, sing something else. And I sang something else. I ended up singing three songs plus Take the Atrium. So then he said to me, oh, by the way, a, late, a woman that we knew brought, us, brought me there. And uh, so he said, where are you working? And she became very new. She, she's still in school. You know, she's just a kid, which embarrassed me. So anyway, Duke said, when will you be out of school? And I told him, he said, well, let me know when you'll be out of school because I can always use a good singer with my band. Well, I was much too sophisticated to believe that. I thought he was being very polite and I appreciated it. He gave me an autographed picture of himself, which I wanted, and asked me to leave the lyrics with him, which I should never have done, my dear. <laughs> but anyway, I was happy because actually all I really wanted out of this meeting was for someone to sing, if you know, they like these birds, sing it. You know, I had no idea about royalties. I knew nothing about any of that. Anyway, uh, I went home for two weeks. That's all everybody's talking about. Joy and Duke and everything's exciting. Two weeks later, we all forgot it, including me. I had given him my address, of course. Six months later, about 10 o'clock at night, I remember everything so vividly. The telephone rings. I pick up the phone. It's a person to person call for Joy and Cheryl. It's a man, you know, voice. I wasn't even dating. Who was this man? It was Pittsburgh. Uh, so I said, this is she, when he asked for Joy Cheryl. He said, this is Duke Ellington. <laughs> well, <laughs> really, my legs went rubber. I had tears coming. I was just overcome. And I know every, I can tell you exactly what was said. He said, I've been thinking about you. Sing something for me. Well, first of all, I was in no condition to sing. But I had to. This was a command performance. And so I said, well, what do you want me to sing? So he said, uh, uh, sing something bluesy. So I was thinking fast, and I, it was a song that, that Billy Holiday used to sing that a lot of people don't know. It's a great song. I've intended to put it in my repertoire. I've never done it since. Uh, called I've Got a Guy. 
So I start singing, I've got a guy. I just sing a few bars because this is long distance. You know, I sing the first day. And he says, no, no, sing, finish, finish, finish. And I finished the song. So he said, your diction is perfect. He said, I'd like to use you to broadcast and record with my band. Now, when did you say you'll be out of school? And I told him. He said, well, let me know when you're out of school so you can join my band. <laughs> well, that was it. That was the end of study. That was the end of everything. I was going to be in show business. You know. I'd like to say that I always dreamed of being in show business. I never thought about it. It was something I loved music, but it was something just too far away from me. But now I was going to be in show business for sure, right? I run up the stairs two, two steps at a time to tell my parents, who's sitting nodding off in the chair, do you know who that was on the phone when I said Duke Ellington? I, I, could, I could have said Sarah Schwartz. They couldn't have cared less. <laughs> and I said, Duke, he wants me to join the band. My father says, you're not going to join the band. I mean, I mean, are you traveling with those men? And I said, but daddy, and it was a whole big thing, you know, back and forth and back and forth. So my mother says, I will write him and explain to him. Well, my mother's a very straight laced lady, and I knew the letter that she was going to write was going to be horrible. I would never make it in the business. <laughs> so I was the writer. I said, Mother, I'll write the letter, and you approve it. You know, so I wrote a very diplomatic letter explaining that, cause, oh, by the way, my father said, the only way I could go was if my mother would travel with me. I said, Duke doesn't want anybody but their mother, you know. So anyway, I wrote the letter. My, I wrote the letter. My mother approved it, and I mailed it off. Well, I thought, Duke wants me to the man. I'll get a letter tomorrow or the next day. A week passed, I didn't hear from him. A month passed, I didn't hear from him. Six weeks passed. Two months passed, I didn't hear from him. In the meantime, there was a woman, an older woman, well, she, an older woman, she was 35, I'd love to. And she, she continually, from the time I met Duke, would say, oh, you're kidding, Duke Ellington. Are you kidding? You know, she was giving me this. She, did, she should have left me alone and encouraged me. So anyway, she comes into my room, my bedroom, and she says, I told you Duke Ellington isn't thinking about you. She said, look at this. And she showed me a newspaper that said, Duke Ellington sends for, I don't know who the person was, from uh, Wings Over Jordan. You remember that group? Uh, and just join his band in California. And I said, so? And I just threw it down. And when she left, I looked at this. And sure enough, this girl's going to join the band. My heart was broken. And when my father came home, I said, see, Daddy, I told you, he doesn't want anybody with their mother. And look, Duke is sending for somebody else. You know." To, so he really felt a little bad about that, you know. So I said, could I call him? I don't know to this day how my father found out where he was, but he did. And I called him. And so I tried to be very, you know, cool. You know. <laughs> and I said to him, um, I saw a newspaper that said you were bringing so-and-so from California to join the band. And I just wondered if you were still interested in me. He said, if you know Duke, you can appreciate it. He said, Mary Smith ordered me to say, I'm not bringing anybody from California. He said, I don't think about it. No, he says, I still want you with the band. He said, look, I got your letter. I should have answered. He said, I kept intending to. He said, of course your mother has to go with you. I didn't expect you to go alone. He said, you finish your school. It's important. And as soon as you're out of school, let me know, and I will send for you and your mother to join the band. <laughs> well, that was it. Well, my mother had to really do a lot of things to get to go with me. And of course, after that, I was just all set. I had all of these marvelous names that I was going to be called. You know, I combined all these exotic names that I was going to be called. And of course, when, I, when, when uh, July came, I joined him in July, I sent him the wire saying where, uh, that I was out of school. He had two tickets, and I joined Duke at the Hotel Sherman, which was a really fabulous place to start the business uh, for a two-month location job. And uh, that was my start in show business. I'd never done anything before. And I really, it was like second nature. I just did it, you know. What year was that? Oh, what does this wise guy get you? <laughs> <laughs> Because Ms. Cheryl has so many beautiful things to say, and I have to go check on my sick wife, and there's nothing, I'm just a bump in the road right now. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you, darling. See you later. Thank you, Clark. Thank you so much. Okay. So, thank you. heard since, or if not, would you recite your lyrics to Well, let's just put it this way. It was my lyrics with some changes made. Like, in my song, I said, uh, let's take the A train and go away and find my lover. He said, go to Sugar Hill and Harlem. And uh, in the release, for instance, I'm just thinking off the top, like, uh, uh, in, the, in the thing they do now, they say, uh, hear the 
Uh, what's the first thing? Hurry. Low, huh? Hurry. Hurry, yeah. Here the crane is coming. And I said, and I said, uh, uh, blowing, feel the breeze is blowing. And he, so in other words, they were different. There were a little substitutes, but it, fundamentally the, the lyric line was the same. And of course, Duke and I, through the years, we sort of joked about that. You know, I mean, I would say, uh huh, yeah, yeah, and he would kind of smile. But really and truly, I have absolutely no bad feelings about it because I would have probably never been in show business had I not done that. I would have, that's not an area I was seeking, you know. And I really credit those lyrics with me getting started in a whole new career. Of course, I could have learned, loved the billions of dollars that uh, the song is making, but listen, what's money? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you tell us about the Kiss of Us? Well, now that song, uh, I, I was one of the early people on the bus, and so was Rex Stewart. And Rex Stewart, by the way, in the band, there were two people, everybody in the band, I was the brat. And everybody was wonderful. Everybody looked out for me. Everybody talked to me. And I was always fast talking as I am now. And uh, two people had nothing to say to me, which was very, you know, kind of bothered me. It was Rex Stewart and, and uh, Johnny Hodges. They were wonderful people, but that was their personality. They just kind of were very aloof and laid back. So this one, and Rex was an early person on the bus, too. And uh, this one particular evening, Rex gets on the bus, and I'm singing this little thing. and. He said, what is that? And I told him, I just wrote that little thing. He said, yeah, that's, that's great, that's great. So then the next night he gets on the bus and he says, he turns to me and he says, da 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 kissing, but write that. He just did the, like, you know, it's so stupid me, I went home and I wrote it. So what I did is he had the melody for the first day, I had all of the lyrics to the, first day in the middle, but and I wrote the melodic line to the release, and we had the song. So Duke, so he says, uh, let's show this to the man, you know. So, right. <laughs> so one evening uh, between the shows, I don't even remember playing, we go in to, to show Duke the song. And after I sang the song, Duke said, that's nice, when did I write that? <laughs> We had, we had added, you know, since all of the truths are coming out of these conferences, we, uh, it, was, it was Rex and myself self on actually as writers, and we added Billy Strayhorn. We really had nothing to do with it, but I love him madly, too. That was the way we got it recorded. What was the first thing that you recorded with the band? Beginning to see the light, and the first thing I recorded sold well over a million copies, which at that time was quite a, quite a thing. That was their first commercial record. They haven't had one since, either commercial record, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also did what? My heart sings. I did my heart sings. Uh, I didn't know about you. Uh, the blues. Um, uh, I let a song go out of my heart. Kissing bug of course, I And I have a note here that you did accentuate the positive. No, no. I did it on the on the on the army show. Yeah, on the, yeah but not not a commercial. I Thank you, pardon? Right. Yes, yes, I said the blues, yeah. Uh, about, what about your arrangements? Were they Billy's very own arrangements, or? Most of the arrangements were more or less Billy's arrangements. Mm -hmm. I know Billy would always teach me the songs. I would go with him to the studio, and we'd learn the songs, and then, you know, they would write them, they would write them out. But it's interesting about the blues. Um, Duke, uh, Duke was a very unusual person. I had no idea I was going to record the blues. The song was performed once by Marie Cole, Marie Ellington, her name was at the time. And of course, you know, she was no relation to Duke. Her husband's name was Ellington, Spurgeon Ellington, and that's how she got the name. But anyway, uh, at the concert in, in Carnegie, she sang the blues. And see, Duke would do that. He had myself learn the song. She learned it. Somebody else would have had to learn the lyrics to the song. We were on the bus coming had a recording session at 8 o'clock, riding all night on the bus, and Duke calls me up front, because that's where he said he was the navigator, and he said to me with his hat pulled down his eyes, he says, you know, I want you to do the blues. I said, what? He says, yeah, I said, but I haven't, he said, yep. and he said, I want you to do it, I want you to record it. It's important, don't you record it. <coughs> what is it? I was wondering if they can hear you, because you, you moved back from the Oh, that's true. <laughs> but anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, he said, I want you to record the blues. He said, yeah, I want you to do it. And I went into the studio at 8 o'clock in the morning and recorded the blues.
papers. And then I did it after that all the time, you know. But, uh, and I love, it's one of my favorite tunes. It's one of the things I like best. Beautiful. Uh, tell us how, what the process was, the procedures. How did Billy teach you a song? What was, what did you do? Did he, well, tell, you tell. Well, not, I guess the way you teach anyone, you know, he would play the music and he would, would sing, you know, although he didn't sing, you know, he let me know how to go. And, uh, and uh, I would learn it. I was uh, a very quick study with, with, with melodies and, uh, and lyrics. In fact, Duke was always composing. When he'd take five, he would not always go off the stand. He would many times sit there and start writing. And he would say, come listen to this, you know. And he would play something. He'd be working on something. And then maybe two days later, he'd say to me, come on, come on. how did that thing go again, you know. And I would remember it, and I would hum it, and he would play it back again, you know. But now when I write, I write the music and the lyrics come together. One is either an inspiration for the other, but they come together. So if I want to remember the song, I just start singing the words to myself, uh, saying the words, and the, and the melody comes, you know, right back to me. But uh, Duke had a wonderful way of saying to me, he'd say to me when he was teaching me a song, because he taught me songs too, he'd say, and when you do this, he said, you know the way you do it, and he would do me, and say, you know, do it like, you know how you do, you know. <laughs> I believe, in listening to the interview you did at the Smithsonian, uh, you said something about you felt when you first went with the band that you better go take uh, vocal coaching. Oh, yes. And tell us what happened then. Well, two things. First of all, let me tell you that about the marvelous names that I had concocted for myself, these sophisticated names. When I showed Duke the list, he said, what is this? I said, this is my name. So what, you want? what do you like? He said, what are you talking about? I said, my name? What, what are you going to call me? He said, Troy and Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> I was very disappointed because I was looking for something, you know, Sean Tu or something, you know. <laughs> uh, what did you just ask me? I forgot uh, about uh... lessons. Oh, lessons. I was so conscientious, you know. I used to insist on myself getting 12 hours sleep. So no matter what time I went to bed, if it was four in the morning, I would force myself to be in bed until four in the afternoon because I wanted to keep my voice, you know, in shape and everything. I was very conscientious about work. Anyway, I thought right away, you know, I said I'm going to because I was not trained, and I said I'm going to go and have a coach, someone coach me so I can know what I'm doing, you know. So I found a very, very wonderful coach in Michigan. I don't remember her name now, but she was very highly recommended. I made arrangements to start studying, and I was going to go the next week. And I thought Duke would be very pleased. I said, Duke, guess what? I've set up an arrangement to have my lessons with so and so. He says, no, don't you dare. He said, I don't want you to have any lessons. He says, I don't want you. He said, you, you have natural talent. If you go to a, 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 co a, a trainer, someone to train you, it's going to destroy your natural talent. He said, I, I don't want you to have lessons. He forbid me to do it. And I was a little disappointed. I thought that I needed to do that, but uh, I never did. Well, obviously you brought a new quality to the music that he found unique and important. Uh, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, at one point in, uh, when you were with the band, you were one of five singers, is that right? When you were with Maria Wait. and Kay and Betty Roche, Phyllis Smiley and Al Hitler. Is that where, oh my goodness. goodness, was it really that big crowd? Uh, that's what oh no, it was uh, not Betty Roche, it was Rosita Davis. Oh, okay. It was, that's right, it was myself, Kay, Marie, Rosita. No. Was Phyllis Smiley? Oh, and Al Hitler. No, Phyllis, the, when I came the first time, you know, the first time I was with Duke and I left to go, because that was supposed to be temporary when I went uh, to, to join Duke, and I was chased back to school, and everybody at the university said, why are you here? You have your career, what are you, what are you coming back for? And I said, yeah, why am I here? <laughs> and then I went back to the bed. But um, there was uh, Phyllis Smiley and Betty Roche the first time that I was with Duke. Uh, they were also there, and I was really a novice, and they were, they were not Kay Davis and Marie Cole, I'll tell you that. But anyway, later, of course, uh, when I joined the band, I was with the band, you know, by myself, and it was wonderful. And then one wonderful evening, or one terrible evening, this woman appears, and it was uh, Marie. I'm like, there's another girl joining the band. And I thought, what is going on here? But she was lovely, and we had a marvelous report. It was fine, you know? So we kind of settled in, the two of us, and Al Hibble was with the band. And then I don't know how much later, maybe next, that next year or well, sometime later, this other person appears. And I say to myself, both of us said, who is this person? You know? And it was Kay Davis. And we thought, why does he need her, you know? And 
she was lovely. And what happened was, we became such great friends. We never had a problem from the day they came. We never had a problem. We became great friends. We're friends until this day. In fact, we were together at the Smithsonian. But we're corresponding, and we even visually see each other with, with close friends. So it worked out very good. Duke did different things. Like, a, a, a Kay was the voice, you know, the obligato. And uh, Marie was more like, um, uh, she did a little bit of singing in the beginning, but she was like, uh, he didn't want to break up the trio. That was the idea, you know. We were doing so well together, you know. She looked pretty, so, you know, why, why mess up a good thing, you know what I mean? You recorded that marvelous that Don't Mean a Thing with yes. the three of us. Was that, a, whose arrangement was that? Uh, I think that was Duke's okay. arrangement. That, I have to tell you something funny about that. Uh, they even went to the point where they got us some outfits alike. And we had these wonderful suits designed for us. And there were, because we did this number, Don't Mean a Thing, with three parts, you know. And uh, we had these cheap shoes on. I think they cost $2 that we were wearing with these outfits. And every time we'd go on the stage, we could hardly walk, you know. <laughs> and I would always say something, not intentionally, that would break them totally up. And on most of the occasions we'd go out there, they would be in hysterics. We'd all be in hysterics, but I would pull it together, you know. And they're still laughing, you know. And I, someone had to sing, and so I'm singing. And Hitler was doing his part. But the funny thing is, you know how complex Duke's music is? People thought they didn't know what was going on, who was missing or whatever. That was, you know, part of uh, his arrangement, you know. <laughs> Did you know the only thing that is, was recorded was the Don't Mean a Thing, right? With the three of you together? No, something else was recorded. I can't think of what it is. We did. What else was recorded? More. Um, yeah. Um, hmm? Solitude. Solitude. Bless your heart. That's, that's it. Solitude. Yeah. That's on the same album, right? Yes. Did, did you do anything else together that no. wasn't recorded? The, the... No, we did that. We did that at, at the theaters usually, you know. That was something we should ask about Ivy. Ivy Ellis. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the Ivy, your, your experience with oh, Ivy. Yes, I have just joined the band. And uh, it was very fortunate for me. I just didn't happen to be, you know, it's a thing. To do with personality. I just didn't have a, a th I was, didn't have the stage fright problem. It doesn't have to do with how great you are or how competent you are. It has to do with your personality because people like uh, Lily Palms, they said, would throw up before every concert. And Ella Fitzgerald was a person that su suffered from nerves, and <clears throat> many people do. But I didn't. I just didn't happen to get nerves. I'm saying that for a reason. So I, I'm there and I'm doing my numbers, and Duke would teach two or three people the same song, you know which was a little unnerving. And uh, so anyway, this particular night, I, they're playing I, a Mood Indigo, and I was in the wings, and I'm standing by because we don't know who's going to be called on. So he says, Mood Indigo. And he says, and I want you to sing a joy. So this was Ivy's song, you know. So when I'm starting to go out, Ivy says right behind me, she says, you better be great, or I'm going to come behind you and do it again. <laughs> She was just probably, you know, trying to make me great, I guess. <laughs> uh, would you tell us about your uh, uh, indoctrination on the bandstand with Freddie Guy? Oh dear, that was also, all this happened that two month engagement at uh, the College Inn in Chicago. Freddie Guy, it was a quick education. He told me about everything, everybody. Somebody would come in and he'd say, see this woman, she comes in every night, to see, she sits at that table and round and round. round. You see this person, round. you see, he, he told me about everything that was going on. So by the time I left there in two months, I knew all the band business, all of what was going on in the lives of the people in the organization. It was my show business education with Freddie Guy, who was a sweetheart. Uh, you, uh you made an album with Luther Henderson, right? Yes. That was a, I wrote all the uh, words and the music to that, a thing called Sherman Spice, and Luther Henderson did the arrangements, some wonderful arrangements. And unfortunately, um, uh, we got a bad shake because it was during the time of the payola, and thousands of records were sent out to disc jockeys, but nobody did anything with it. And I think most people have not even heard it. And it's a fairly decent album, I think. 
and uh, it's unfortunate. I've always said I wish I could, you know, revive it and uh, do something with it. I don't know, maybe we still can. Luther's done a lot of work with Duke. Did he do, was he doing any work with Duke when you were with the band? No, but when I went, when I did the um, uh, New York engagement, we were setting up, he wanted me to do some arrangements with, with uh, Luther, but we never really, Luther and I, I mean, never really got to do it. Some, some ideas that he had, but you know, Luther did my television show, you know, I did it a children's show for 13 years in New York, and uh, Luther was what we called the music man. And it was so funny because I did the songs that were appropriate for children, but Luther was at the piano and I was singing, so they had a little, you know, jazz to it, and the guys would listen to it. It was on, on Sunday morning, the guys would listen to the music. We heard that show, we loved what you did, you know. So we sort of played to them also. Okay. We have five minutes. We have five minutes. <laughs> okay, well, we have not even got to my people. Um, uh, oh, I, well, just as we get to my people, you're going to go, okay? You were there. Um, uh, okay, Louis, thank you for for being with us. And uh, Louis Belson, incidentally, got to... Before we get to it, I want you to know that Louis Belson was honored with the United States of America's highest prize this year, he got the National Endowment for the Arts Jazz Masters Award in January. And uh, my people, uh, I'm going to rush through my people, but um, anyway. <clears throat> You were in My People in Chicago in um, August of 1963, is that right? And um, this was uh, a, commission, a show commissioned by the um, Committee for what, Emancipation Celebration. It was the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And the show was at McCormick Place in New York. I mean, in, New York, in Chicago. And the reason it ran three weeks is because that's all the organization had booked the McCormick Place for. Duke always wanted to have a longer run of it. Uh, it, there is an album, as we all know. Tell us about the show and how what Duke said to you about and how you got into it and what the production was like. It was the only time in the history of the Ellington Band when there were two Ellington Bands, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that started every everything I did with Duke. He'd call me with that same kind of you know uh, thing that you know he needed me for this, you know. So anyway, it was it was a joy to go there. And it was in the summer. My daughter was out of school, so I took her with me too. And as it turned out, she did the narration on the beginning of. Uh, my people, because Duke just, he did, it was a, an afterthought. He saw my daughter, he knew her, you know, of course, and he said, Rochelle, you're going to do the narration. And she was very happy, you know, to be doing the narration. It was really a marvelous experience. It was Duke's, uh, it was Duke's way of expressing the uh, racial problem. It was his way of giving uh, outlet to that, you know. And as you know, most of the material on that deals with that. And he was really very happy about that show. He was the director, the producer, the arranger, the everything, you know. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful show. The music was wonderful. And uh, the people really uh, responded to it. Duke was, uh, was it rehearsed in Chicago? Because Duke was traveling. Yeah, right? well, we, we rehearsed it. We did all the rehearsing right there. It was, you know, rehearsing primarily was learning the tunes. Mm -hmm. So we had to learn the tunes and then the, then the choreographing of the... Uh, because uh, Tali Beatty, he did the choreography in New York and then came to Chicago, and uh, Billy Strayhorn played the piano in the band, right? No, uh, Jimmy... Jimmy, no, Jimmy Jones. 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 Billy Strayhorn was, what, the conductor? No, no, Jimmy Jones was the conductor. Billy Strayhorn was involved? Well, Jimmy, yes. sure. Billy Strayhorn was there, yeah. He was, oh, okay. Because yeah. Duke was there for a portion of the time, then Duke went away. Yeah, quite a few of the members of the band, well, as you said, it was kind of a... a, a yeah, well, he, he picked... Individuals and the other people, some of them were alumni, right? right. And, and he had two bands working simultaneously. And but uh, uh, who were some of the regulars in the band? Um, I'm trying to remember. I know Louis Dawson came back yes. just for that. For Bill the, Perry, Russell Proko. Yes, yes. Russell. And, and Joe Benjamin had worked with him before and yes. worked with him later. He was the, the bass player there. And um, Harold Ashby for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And Bill Berry, yes, of course, Bill Berry, thank you. And Britt Whitman. Britt, yes, yes. Britt Whitman. So they know. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> 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 it's like this. Oh, Clark. <laughs> uh, 
All right, we're, I, we're just about out of time, but I heard that yesterday you recorded in Sweden. It right? was wonderful. You know, I was really very, very skeptical about it because I had not seen any of the musicians. I had no idea what I was going to do, and I thought, why am I doing this? It's too fast, you know? They said, don't worry, it's going to be fine. Well, it was wonderful. I mean, it was a delightful <laughs> thing. I, because I, you know, I have to be in the mood to sing. I mean, and the, the musicians don't move me. I can't, nothing comes out, you know. And we started, they started playing, and I started singing, and it was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. It was really nice. Was there some element material there? It was all element material. That's what I wanted to hear you say. <laughs> <laughs> Because the, the, our, the uh, CD is going to be about the Swedish experience here, so that's why it's oh, all well and well. They'll have other things also, other things on the CD. Do we know uh, anything about a release date? Yes, in the fall. I did some wonderful songs. I did Lush Life, which oh, yes. I love. Great. I did The Mood Indigo. Mm -hmm. I did uh, I Let a Song Out of My Heart, Don't Get Around Much Anymore, and uh, Squeeze Me. <laughs> so you left out in the, in the beginning. Huh? Uh, I'm beginning to see the light. You left that. Oh, I did. I'm beginning to see the light. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I did that song so often? I just have to tell you this. I mean, we, like on the stage, it was like, you know so much that you know I thought, but that that was the hit. I had to do it. And one day I walk out on the stage and I'm walking to the microphone. I say, "What is the first line?" <laughs> <laughs> and I thought. My God, what am I going to do? What is the first line? I'm walking because the stages were very large. You know? I said, what is the, I'm going to, and as soon as my note was hit, the word came out. Of my mouth. <laughs> you could do I'm beginning to see the light even in the dark. I thought I could, but I was having a problem then. Um, and so this will be added to our wonderful store of Joya Sarah vocals. Um, Including uh, Joyous Things Do, right? And uh, that's that another was, album. Yes, that, that was, was on Capitol, right? That was on Capitol. Yes, yeah, Joyous Things Do. Uh, uh, Do was unofficially uh, uh, oh, there. True. Yeah, I did. I was working at a club in uh, I can't think of the club, but Mr. Kelly. No, yeah, Mr. Kelly's. And Duke was in town also. And when he found out I was doing this set, and they wanted me to do a Ellen thing, Joyous Things Do. So. Duke says, oh, that's wonderful, listen. And so anyway, uh, there are about five of the guys from the band in there, and Duke was in the control room, but it was not to be known that he was in. So if you see my album, it doesn't say anything about Duke. It tells the guys that were there, but it doesn't say because he was signed with someone else, you know. But Duke was in the control room. He had to take over, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we ought to bring that up. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think our time is up. Thank, Thank you. you.